Hi and welcome to a video on indefinite integrals and the net change theorem and this is going to be more of the algebraic um, interpretation of this certainly the um, fundamental theorem of calculus this is one of the two parts of it which allows us to do this um, but we're going to talk through some of the problems that you might get tripped up on as you're actually finding what these indefinite integrals need to become um, and again there are animations, there are um, some good graphical or visual interpretations of this net change theorem that you can sort of look up and see. So what we're doing again is we're really just identifying what the one part of the fundamental theorem of calculus says which is if I'm anti-differentiating this function, in other words this is the answer to some derivative that I took, I can work backwards and figure out what was that original function that I was looking at. So just like we would have done if I were calculating this derivative of this function, I would kind of want to do a rewrite here when I'm calculating this antiderivative as well. In fact, with antiderivatives, your hands are tied a lot more than they are for derivatives. With derivatives, you have options. You know, do I want to use product rule? Do I want to use quotient rule? Can I take the natural log? With antiderivatives, so far you have power rule. You also know your trig antiderivatives. You know the antiderivative of, you know, 3 over x with respect to x is natural log, for example. But um, otherwise, we don't have the anti-differentiation rules like we do for differentiation. So we're going to have to go through quite a lot more rewrites, I think, in these. So let's do that. So I have x to the, this is 3 over 2, because again, it's power over root, and then plus x to the 2 thirds, again, power over root. And don't forget that dx part, that is what you are anti-differentiating with respect to. So that's who you're allowed to do the power rule on. So I will leave a space here because I have fractional exponents and you'll get better at that the more you do this. Keep your base the same of x, not sure what that was. Add 1 to your exponent. So if I'm adding 2 halves to 3 halves, I do get 5 halves. And instead of dividing by 5 halves, I'm going to multiply by that reciprocal 2 fifths. That's why I left that space. So I'll do that again. Plus, I have a fractional exponent, so I'm going to leave a space for my coefficient. And then if I'm adding 1 to this exponent, you're adding 3 thirds. So that would be x to the 5 thirds. And again, I don't want to divide by a fraction. I don't want to divide by 5 thirds. So I'm going to multiply by its reciprocal 3 fifths and the all elusive plus c. This is a constant of integration. And you have probably talked about this in um, learning the overall power rule for antiderivatives. Um, but in general, it needs to be there because if you take the derivative of this function, you should get this part right here, the integrand, what you were taking the integral of. Well, if there was a plus 7 or a plus 14 over 3 or a minus pi, right, some constant on the end, and you take the derivative of a constant, it goes to 0, so we're not really sure what that constant of integration is unless we're given more information. And these are the indefinite integrals. They're um, not as easy to check on your calculator, obviously, because they're not computational. They don't represent one finite area. They represent all the areas that it could be. That's why it's the net change. Okay, so let's look at number two. This is also meant to show you that not always do things increase in difficulty as you go on. This does not even require a rewrite. What I would like to, you to pay attention to, though, is that this whole cubic function here was in parentheses. You're anti-differentiating all that with respect to x. So I'm just ready to go. I will keep my base the same. 
I will add one to the exponent and divide by that number. So x to the fourth over four plus, keep your coefficient for now, six and then my base is x. I'll add one to my exponent and divide by that number. So x cubed over three minus one. And again, I'm not sure what to turn that one into unless you knew what you were anti-differentiating with respect to, or you took the derivative, in other words, with respect to x and got one, so this must have been a one x. And don't forget that plus c. Certainly you can leave that, but I recognize that six over three is in fact two. So if you wanted to go through one more re right here, you can. Just don't forget that constant of integration. Some people actually start their problem with c plus and then write all of this, and this is the same as well. That way they don't forget their constant of integration. Okay, so let's get into um, a little bit more of these specifics. I know that sometimes you kind of want there to be rules for antiderivatives that just really aren't there. So I know we see a fraction bar and in derivatives we think, ooh, ooh, quotient rule, um, but it's not. It's really just a rewrite. There is no quotient rule for anti-differentiation, so we're just going to have to anti-differentiate um, using power rule. So I can either write this one of two ways. I can separate and reduce this way where I'm looking at each individual term dividing by this x to the fourth and then write out my negative exponents that way, or I can bring up this x to the negative fourth if I want to see it as a multipli multiplication type of problem where I'm distributing in x to the negative four and you're going to add your exponents um, when doing so. Either way, I should have x to the negative two, don't forget to start your parenthesis, you're taking the antiderivative of x to the negative two plus two x to the negative three minus three x to the negative four, again, with respect to x. So please do a double check. Do you have a nice integral symbol? No bounds. Do you have parentheses around your whole function? And do you have that dx? A lot of people forget that dx, and in Calc 1, you know, it's not really correct, but you might not, I'll say, get caught, right, where you're doing the the problem the wrong way because we're in single variable calculus. Once you head further down the road in calculus though, you get out of that single variable calculus. You now get into multivariable calculus. So that dx is going to tell you who did you take the derivative of with respect to to get that function that you have in those parentheses. In other words, what variable are you anti-differentiating with respect to? And that becomes very important. So, all right, I am moving on. So I'm going to say this is no more integral symbol. I am integrating right now, so you don't need the antiderivative symbol anymore. So I will add one. So be careful with your negatives. Negative two plus one is negative one and divide by that, that exponent. Plus two, if I add one to negative three, I get negative two and divide by negative two. Keep your coefficient of minus three. Keep your base the same of x. Add one to your coefficient, you get negative three, and divide by that same um, exponent of negative three plus c. Again, you could be done. Make sure you do not have that integral symbol, right? And I'm gonna just rewrite this without negative exponents just in case you needed to eventually do something with this, maybe the negative exponents um, won't be liked. And also this two divided by negative two can divide out. So let's just see what this looks like without the negative exponents. This would be negative one over x. This would be minus one over x squared. And this would be plus one over x cubed, again, plus c. Okay, not too bad. Just make sure you're careful and slow on your rewrites so that you don't make an error on that because if you make an error on your rewrite, your integral or antiderivative doesn't have a chance. 
So speaking of rewrites, here's one that um, I hope would be a pretty straightforward rewrite. If I'm asked to find the antiderivative of y squared to y with respect to y, it is just really a product of y times y to the half. So really this just is y to the three halves. So I can use power rule on this. Again, I'm going to leave a space because I have a fractional exponent. I'm going to add 1 for my power rule, so this will become y to the 5 halves. I'm not going to divide by 5 halves. I'm going to multiply by 2 fifths. And that was really it for that one. All right, let's get into one that we might not recognize. So I am going to relocate this constant coefficient, right? This is a coefficient of my whole problem. So I am going to put it out in front of my integral symbol here. Because we might have a better chance of integrating or recognizing that integral right there. So that integral I know where that came from. Do you know where that came from? That came from inverse, are you saying it? <laughs> inverse sine of x. That was the derivative of inverse sine of x. And you had three that we asked you really to memorize, inverse sine of x, inverse cosine, um, as well as inverse tangent. Okay. All right, speaking of trig, that was inverse trig. This is not, this is giving you trig. Again, I do not have a quotient, right, that I'm talking about. So I need to be able to do a rewrite. And we should recognize that if there's trig involved in the problem, my rewrite usually involves trig identities whether it's Pythagoreans, whether it's their basic identities, no matter what it is, my rewrite usually involves some form of trig identities. And in this case, there is nothing that I'm going to do with that sine of x. However, sine of 2x is a double angle identity. So that is 2 sine x cosine x by definition. So now if you can simplify this at all, you should do that. Well, I do know that the ratio of sine x to sine x should be 1. So really, I'm left with 2 cosine x dx. And I am absolutely going to pull that 2 out front so you can see this maybe a little bit better. So I am integrating actually cosine x with respect to x or cosine x dx and I'm just going to double my answer. This happened with limits as well if you recall. If we had the limit of 2 times a function, we could bring that 2 out in front of that limit. Um, it made our problem a little bit easier to work with sometimes and that will be the case with these antiderivatives as well. So. I know the derivative that gets me cosine as an answer, and that is sine of x. I know I need to double it, but I do check it. I'll put my plus c in a second. I want to make sure this is correct. If you take the derivative of sine x, you should get this function right here. So if I take the derivative of sine x with respect to x, I get cosine x. So that's perfect. So I'll put my plus c. And this is my antiderivative. Okay, so speaking of trig, let's see what another one might look like. And when we have thetas, right, we like it when our variable then is theta. So you'll notice now I'm anti-differentiating with respect to theta. But what we don't like sometimes is that there's just a theta right there. Well, that's my variable. So this is no more difficult than saying if this is my variable, right now theta is to the first, so I will add 1 to that exponent, so it's theta squared over 2. And then I'm going to say minus just for a second here. 
I need to figure out whose derivative gives me cosecant theta, cotangent theta as an answer. And if I take the derivative of cosecant theta, I get negative cosecant theta, cotangent theta. So I want to take the derivative of positive cosecant theta, and that will give me negative cosecant theta, cotangent theta. And I'll put a plus C, call it a day for that one. Okay. All right, one last one, and it's just really a matter of sort of where is the 3, right, in all of this. So I'm going to anti-differentiate 3 over x, which we've kind of talked about already, minus x squared over 3 minus 3 to the x. And I honestly think that separating this out is not a bad idea. So I'm going to make sure everybody gets that dx. So I'm going to integrate 3 over x with respect to x minus x squared over 3 with respect to x and minus 3 to the x with respect to x. Just so I can see all three of these as three separate problems. Now, since I cannot combine like terms in the beginning, chances are, not 100%, but chances are you won't be able to combine like terms when you're done either. So separating these into three different integrals is not making my problem any more difficult, I promise. So I can pull out this constant coefficient of 3 if it makes it easier for you to see that the antiderivative of 1 over x dx cannot be power rule. Again, if I do that, then I add 1 to that exponent and I get x to the 0 and then I would be dividing by 0. So I cannot use power rule when it's 1 over x. So I just have to think whose derivative gets me 1 over x as an answer and that is natural log of x, but I do need x in absolute value bars. And that was a domain um, issue that we talked about and that's because the only restriction in the integral for x is that x cannot be 0. So I want that to be the only restriction in here as well. And we know that we cannot take the natural log of negative numbers, so the absolute value will then turn it positive. All right, so the first integral becomes 3 natural log of x. The next integral that I'm going to evaluate is just power rule. So I'll keep my base the same of x, and it'll be now x to the 3 over 3 times 3, which is 9. And then I need to think of real quick, what was the derivative of 3 to the x? Because I think that will help a lot of you. The derivative of 3 to the x was 3 to the x times natural log of 3. And technically, if you were going to apply chain rule, times the derivative of x, which is 1. So if you're working backwards, right, and, and you're saying, okay, I have sort of this derivative here, I would need to divide that natural log of 3 out. If you're taking the derivative and you're multiplying by natural log of 3, when I'm going backwards, I'm dividing by natural log of 3. So this antiderivative is going to be 3 to the x divided by natural log of 3. Because again, its derivative would have been 3 to the x times natural log of 3, and you need to work backwards from that, so you need to divide by natural log of 3. And so this is literally my answer. But I think it does help sometimes when you have separate terms if you do separate them all the way. I hope you found this video on our net change theorem and one part of the fundamental theorem of calculus helpful. Thanks for watching.